Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Dead End Sports Podcast. This is a weekly sports podcast. We like to call it the best couple of hours of your sports week. I am your host, 12 Kyle. And again, welcome to the Dead End Sports Podcast. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Going to be NBA heavy, get some baseball talk in there as well, as well as our final thoughts. Uh, but before we get started, man, got to introduce the homies. Uh, first up, my man, BZ430. BZ, what up, though? What up, though? Just want to give a, a quick uh, let the fans know that this will probably be like our, our last show, kind of like the summer season, and we'll probably get back at it in another about a month or so, or less, or less anything crazy happens during this free agency come July 1st that we just got to touch on. But just want to give the fans a heads up so they won't be like, hey, what's going on with that in sports? <laughs> you no, know, you never know. We might have like Q or somebody come fill in and do some, do some, you know, sports talks in the next few weeks or whatever just to hold it down. But Exactly. Just want to get the fans that heads up. Summer 17, we taking it off. We taking it yeah. off. <laughs> also joining us is the homie Ken. Ken, what up, man? Uh, chilling. Ready to put a bow on the NBA season. No doubt, no doubt. Let's start right there, man. Uh, as the, At the time of this recording, uh, we have witnessed the NBA draft. Uh, as we did our podcast last week, uh, we talked about some scenarios and things that you know could possibly happen, which guy would go where. Uh, one thing we did not see coming was Jimmy Butler being traded from the Chicago Bulls to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, nobody saw that coming. Uh, there were some rumors and little whispers. Uh, I want to say maybe the day of, uh, but you know things got really hot and heavy as it got closer and closer to the the time frame, and then. They dropped a bomb on us during the draft that Jimmy Butler would be traded um, for, I think it was Zach Levine. Uh, who else was Chris in that Dunn. Chris, Chris, Yeah, Chris Dunn. Dunn uh, and I think a draft pick, draft pick yeah. which, which ended up being, uh, the, the I think, the 10th pick, I think. Um, so, yeah, let's start right there, man. Um, on the paper, if you look at it on paper, B, did, did, the, did the Bulls lose in this trade? Uh, yeah, you pretty much just gave up your best player for like nothing, and I and now I, I'm interested to see what Minnesota gonna do with um now that they got Jimmy Butler, Andrew Wiggins, and Anthony Towns, Car Anthony Towns, along with Rick Rubio, a point guard that's gonna distribute. Mhm. So, but yeah, I think the Bulls. It's at this point they just I don't know they just about to just start over from you know start from scratch because like I said, you just gave up your best player, arguably, you know second, third best player in the Eastern Conference, you know, to another team. So, yeah, that was a bad move on Bulls just for some, just for not much. I mean, yeah, Zach Levine, nice. You know, Chris Dunn is an up-and-coming young point guard. But, you know, are you going to – of course you're not going to win with that. You, you're not going to season right. point. You can win with that right away. Yeah, they make the trade, man, for Zach Levine, who's coming off an ACL injury. Uh, Chris Dunn, uh, who's coming off – what most would say a very bad rookie season. And uh, the pick that they took was uh, Arizona's Laurie uh, Markinen. Um, I remember, I remember watching him play the kick and play, uh, but yeah, they still don't stack up to Jimmy Butler, man. So Ken, I got to ask you, man, the bulls, man, <laughs> what did you think when you, when you heard this, man, did they lose in this trade? Yeah, of course they lost, man. I, I you know, as soon as I saw it, I was like, what? Whatever was going on with that, with within that organization, they uh, they felt that they had they needed to get rid of him, and almost just start over. We've seen Jimmy Butler's uh, trainer come out and say that he know drug dealers with more morals, values, <laughs> you know, than the Bulls management. You basically gave up, like B said, a, an All Star, a guy that is not afraid of the moment, a guy that closes, a guy that can go to toe with LeBron because that's what we're all, you know, we kind of use that as a measuring stick, at least I do. Um, a mm -hmm. guy that can go toe to toe with LeBron for a guy that came off an ACL injury last year. Loads of talent, and we've seen what he can do when he's on the court. So the guy can actually, he can play, but of course you have to take injuries like that seriously. Uh, Chris Dunn, like you mentioned, Kyle, he had a, 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 a poor uh, rookie campaign, but you know, I, I do want to go back to before he stepped on the court. 
what we saw when he, when he was in college. The guy has talent. He just wasn't mm-hmm. able to put it together. And, you know, some people would say Tibbs has a thing about not playing rookies. So mm-hmm. it could have been Tibbs holding him back, and we may get a chance to see Chris Dunn spread his wings. You know, you, you kind of get a guy that can possibly do something that you can build a franchise with, and then you get the seventh pick, uh, Mark Canning. I haven't seen him play, so I don't know what he's about. So, you know, right now it looks bad because you know what you had, and with the three that they got back, you don't know what you have outside of Levine. Just to sum this up, man, they are a hot mess. They got a coach who can't coach. They got pieces that don't fit. So I don't know what they're doing there, and I think this offseason – and the, everything leading up to the preseason would be interested to see. Interesting to see how they formulate their team. I was as surprised as everybody was to to find out, you know, that Jimmy Butler had been traded. And then, you know, when you hear what he was tra- or whom he was traded for, again, Levine coming off of ACL. I mean, uh, and and what was interesting was that, uh, you know, Chicago uh, had. I'm sorry, not Chicago. Minnesota had exper- had experimented with Zach Levine running some point. Uh, obviously, Chris Dunn uh, had a phenomenal college career, but struggled mightily. Um, and you know, there were some insiders uh, who wondered if he was going to get any better. You know, because he was struggling with his shot and was struggling to get his own shot. Uh, now, again, the marketing kid. I saw him at Arizona. He's good. He 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 was very solid in college. Um, but as you know, this is, you know, this is the pros, this whole different ball game. And you trade him for a guy who this past season put up 24 points, 6.2 rebounds a game and five, uh, five assists you know, to go along with almost two steals. Um, and he only played 37 minutes a game. So a guy who was an all-star and I mean, he basically carried the bulls to the, to the, um, to the playoffs. Uh, my thing is, when you, when you trade a superstar, you can it, unless you're trading superstar for superstar, you hardly ever do you get you know value for value. But I mean, really to to get this, I mean, I, my thing was, and we'd heard some rumors about possibly Jimmy Butler going to um you know the Celtics, and the Celtics have all of these picks and have all of these assets or whatever like that. And I'm sure pretty sure when Danny Ainge got the word, he had been like, damn, they 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 gave him away for that, you know, so. I was really surprised. Um, I read something earlier where uh, Antoine Walker, former former uh, NBA player Antoine Walker, uh, and he gave a quote. And I, and I don't know how close Antoine Walker is to the Bulls situation, but he said, quote, Jimmy Butler is a young guy killer. He's a bad locker room guy. A lot of outbursts took place throughout the season with coaches, with players. You try to build something, especially in Chicago, and he's going to be your best player. He has to be a leader on and off the court, and he did a poor example of that. I think that's why the Bulls parted ways with him, close quote. Um, That came as a surprise. Again, I don't know how close Antoine Walker is, but, I mean, guys in the league talk to guys who, you know, have played and and stuff, and, I mean, it's all rumor and speculation and innuendo, but, again, to give up – Jimmy Butler for what they gave up. Yeah, it's to to answer the question if they lost the trade. Yeah, they definitely lost this trade. Um, now on the flip side, you're looking at you know Jimmy Butler going to the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves and teaming up with Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns. Ken, how, how good can this team be? How good can Minnesota be next year? Well, um, I think they. I, I definitely think they could compete for an eight spot. What the Timberwolves shown last year is that we already we, we know we already know that they have a lot of talent, NBA talent, NBA talent that can play at superstar levels. We saw that. Carl Carl Anthony Towns is a legit baller. Andrew Wiggins doesn't provide a lot of um, ancillary stats, a lot of those extra stats that um that people like outside of scoring, but um, he's still young. And we've seen that offensively, he can get it done. Um, But what they lacked was that veteran guy that knew how to win games late. Because they had a lot of leads in in games last year. 
They just couldn't close the games out. And they would start making young mistakes, which you would expect that to happen with a team like that. So I think with him coming in there, he can stabilize them a little bit more than they have have been because he can kind of keep them composed in tight games or keep them like in the moment when they have like 10 or 15 leads so they don't get too cocky and blow it and also provide a little bit of heart so they don't get down on themselves when they're down by 10 or 15 and provide the leadership that you will hope to see now going back to what you know walker said there were reports out of chicago that Jimmy Butler basically became a superstar. So there is some substance to what he's saying. Okay. That the organization kind of, you know, got fed up with it. And that, you know, he he started feeling himself. And, you know, I I think Thibs may have been able to keep him, you know, um, in check. But, man, he's going to a a great situation with a coach he has a, a, a history with. A history of winning with. So, yeah, man, I think they can definitely compete for the A spot. There it is. There it is. What about you, B? Uh, Minnesota, man, how good can this team actually be? Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, like I said before, I think now you you, you got them, you got a nice little, nice little young big three going with, with Butler, Wiggins, and at the Carnegie Towns. You got Ricky Rubio, a, a distributing first point guard. Um, you know, he's not going to take. You know, a lot of bulk of shots. Um, I can't remember. Uh, do they still got uh, Muhammad off the bench? I can't remember who was that, how their bench was looking. But, you know, yeah, I can see them definitely being yeah, in the Yeah, uh, they still uh, got him. Yeah. And they got that, yeah, that, so, that power forward, too. That's pretty good, too. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah, they, they at least working with about a good seven to eight-man rotation with the young group, you know, Corey guys. I'm pretty sure Butler, you know, would like the winning attitude that's going to be the, – the wanting to win attitude from Andrew Wiggins – in Carl Anthony Towns, so I think I think you know actually six, seven, or eight seed. I mean anything's possible for you know for, for them for them boys. I mean it's it's not like you know Ken mentioned it earlier is the Western Conference you know overrated. So if they are overrated like he mentioned, <laughs> I, can see them, I can see them getting as high as a six seed in the West. You know if they if they like you know Ken also mentioned about Coach Tibbs being you know coaching you know Jimmy Butler. So that's a familiarity right there. So. Yeah, I can see them getting as high as a six seed. I think that's possible. No doubt, no doubt. Also joining us is the homie FIFO. FIFO, what's up, man? Yo, yo, what's good? Chilling, 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 man. We're just kicking it right here. Uh, I want to throw out the, the question back to you, man. Um, two parts. Uh, did the Bulls lose in this trade and giving up Jimmy Butler? And the flip side, how good can the Minnesota Timberwolves be? No, the Bulls did not lose um, in this trade. Actually, okay. I think that it was a, a pretty much even trade. Um, and this is the reason why. When Zach Levine was healthy, he averaged 20 points a game. And we're talking about a guy that's under 21 in the league averaging 20 points. What did Jimmy average? 22, 23? So, you know, you're, you're, you're getting the scoring. Obviously, Levine's coming off of that ACL injury. So hopefully he can get back to what he was. Um, also... Chris Dunn. Chris Dunn had a bad rookie year, but let's be honest. How much success has Thibodeau had with rookies? None. Because Jimmy didn't get playing time as a rookie. Meritick barely got playing time as a rookie. Rookies and Thibodeau don't go don't go together like oil and vinegar. It, 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 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, it, it's, that's just what it is. Thibodeau likes veteran guys or yo- even Luol Deng. You know what I'm saying? Luol Deng, when he first came into the league, yeah, he had a decent rookie year, but it wasn't until about third, fourth, fifth year where he actually established himself with the Bido. So at the end of the day, I don't blame it on Chris Dunn. He's going to have a better year. I I all but guarantee it. He'll have a better second year than he did his rookie year. Um, and then also they got a draft pick um, where where they drafted uh, Mark Markinen, uh another shooter. Um, for Fred Hoiberg's space and pace uh, offense. So I, I think the Bulls came out pretty well. Obviously, everybody's talking about you would want to get an all-star in return for Jimmy. 
that typically doesn't happen in trades. You got a potential all-star with Zach Levine, if he can get back healthy and continue to progress. And you got an also potential uh, starter, maybe fringe all-star in Chris Dunn. And then you got another draft pick. So I like it from the Bulls' perspective. I, uh, could they have gotten more? Obviously, I don't know. I don't have sources. I don't know what other deals were on the table. But I think they made pretty well. T-Wolves can be damn good, uh, mainly because you have Coach Thibodeau. Last year, they ranked like 25th or 26th in defensive rating, which is unlike Thibodeau. Every time Thibodeau coaches or is on a, a, a coaching bench, you know, the, he's part of a top 10 defense. So I think adding Jimmy Butler is going to is going to be gr- is is greatly going to increase the production of the Minnesota Timberwolves for a couple of reasons. Number one, as a player. Sometimes when a coach barks instructions at you and nobody understands exactly what he means or how to execute, it's always good to have a player that knows exactly what the coach wants on the floor, especially defensively. So Jimmy is going to be quarterbacking that defense, making sure Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns and all of these other young pieces understand what the Bido expects every play defensively. So I think just that alone, they are going to be a playoff team. I think Jimmy Butler alone vaults that defense to a top 10 defense again for Thibodeau. Um, And I think that when you look at the roster in its totality, I think they still need moves to make. I, I don't know if offensively they're going to be great, mainly because when you look at Ricky Rubio, he does not have an outside shot. Jimmy is suspect with the three-point shot and just jump shooting in general. Wiggins is suspect, you know, and Carl Anthony Towns is still progressing. So offensively, I don't know if they're going to be that much greater, but defensively they should jump leaps and bounds, therefore making the playoffs in the Western Conference. Where do they land? I think anywhere between five to eight is pretty much open for okay. them. Um, it just really depends on how well they're going to mesh defensively. But um, I, I love it for the Timberwolves because I think the Timberwolves were in a position where they needed to add a veteran that can play. Not a veteran that's going to you know, play 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes a game and talk about all this, that, whatever, and teach these guys how to be professionals on and off the court. They need a veteran that can play and actually show them what they need to do on the court. And who better than Jimmy Butler that was groomed and learned and became a star up under Tom Thibodeau. So, again, I think defensively these guys make leaps and bounds jumps. I think they make the playoffs. I think they're going to definitely be um, a team you don't want to play against. But they're still not going to be ready to take that championship step. Um, like I always say, you got to make the playoffs as a young team. You got to get your, your behind whooped a couple of times, mm-hmm. and then you'll be ready to take that next step. They need to get to the playoffs. Cat and Wiggins need to understand what playoff basketball is. They need to get beat, and then we'll see next well, the year after if they are able to take that lesson and take the next step. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I think you guys made some great points. I think it's uh, with that T Wolves team, they're young, but having a veteran, and that's the thing we don't see. We don't see a lot of veteran leaders who are still on that uh, superstar level that Jimmy Butler is. I mean, you can make a case that he's you know top ten, top fifteen player in the league. Uh, so you know to pair him up with those young guys, uh, I definitely think that this team could go. Uh, I'd say, you know, definitely a playoff bound, you know, all things considered, if they can stay healthy and they play defensively, uh, I, I think they can fall anywhere between sit the sixth and the eighth seed, seed maybe the fifth seed, uh, depending on how the West shakes out. But um, it, I, I'm looking forward to seeing this team because I got a chance and I, I think I probably saw more T-Wolves games last year than most people. Um I, this team is a, a young, exciting. If you like basketball, if you're, you know, and this is this is one of the teams that I think sh- people should watch. You know, we we heard the the whispers and the yells and the screams that oh, the NBA is boring. The 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 regular season is boring. If you like basketball, watch this team because I promise you, they're going to be fun on both ends of the floor to watch, and they're going to get after it. And they're young and they're energetic, and you know, Thibodeau will have those guys ready on a night to night basis. And I think part of the issue going back to Jimmy Butler, 
you know, part of the issue was, you know, Jimmy Butler, I at least from the outside looking in, looks like he never bought into Fred Hoiberg. And I don't know that the Bulls organization necessarily supports. I don't think there's a situation where they said, okay, well, we're going to choose Hoiberg over Jimmy. I don't think that was the case at all. But I think he, Jimmy Butler didn't buy in because part of the reason why he didn't buy in because he's a Thibodeau guy. So, you know, it, it makes more sense for him to be there. He was, you know, he and he said all the right things since being traded. I'm interested to see how this team is going to shake out. Uh, moving on, uh, as I mentioned at the top, uh, the NBA draft happened. That was obviously the bomb that happened during the draft. Uh, but the NBA draft happened, man. Um, we saw a lot of familiar names come off the board, a bunch of <laughs> one and done freshmen. Uh, my man, John Calipari was out there recruiting on TV. Uh, we saw a dude show up in a red suit, a whole bunch of things happened with the draft, man. So let's start right there. Uh, let's start with the winners. B, if you had to say this team or that team won, who who would you list as your winners for the NBA draft thus far? Uh, I would say the, I guess the obvious, uh, 76ers, um, get it in folks. Uh, me and FIFA was talking about this, this past uh, Sunday at the uh, dead end shoot. Like you got you a guy now who can, you got a scoring guard, that scoring guard who can also play point guard as well. He's going to also push the ball, kind of help Ben Simmons out whenever Ben Simmons not pushing the rock or playing point. But we all know Ben Simmons is the prime ball handler. He's just not going to be listed as that, but. I think that's good that they have that scoring guard to compliment Ben Simmons because we know Ben Simmons is going to be having them zip, zip-worthy zip passes, man. That's going to be crazy, and you're going to definitely need that off guard. That's going to that's gonna be ready to get buckets, and I think folks is going to be – I'm looking forward to Summer League. I know that's one thing I'm definitely looking forward to. I cannot wait to see Summer League and see how some of these rookies, you know, are going to be looking so far. Even though, of course, you're playing against other rookies and guys, walk-on guys trying to get on, but it's just still good to see, like, what – with these, you're gonna be eyeing like, okay, yeah, he might be something when the season starts. So, but yeah, I would say Sixers. Just you know, I mean, and I mean, and they can't really say that was an easy pick because there's a lot of people that had the first overall picks and they have never been winners. <laughs> so, but I definitely think Sixers made the right pick by getting uh, getting folks. Man, I think that I think that was that was that was the obvious number one pick to get. Man, it's just unfortunate for him, you know, him playing out in the West Coast and the fact that his team sucked. <laughs> Washington that sucked. We didn't get a chance to see much, you know, much of him ball, you know. So, you know, this is gonna be this is gonna be a lot of people seeing him first time once this NBA season starts. A lot of people gonna see. Okay, let's see what this number one pick overall pick was all about. So, yeah, yeah man, I, I think Sixers got got the right choice, man. It was either he was either him or maybe a small four position. But I'm glad they went. I'm glad they went with folks as, as the number one pick. So they they came out for winners for me. Okay. Okay. What about you, Ken? Uh, who Who do you think were some of the winners with the uh, NBA draft? Um, for me, I like what the Kings did, man. Um, you know, they got right. Fox, they got um, Justin Jackson, and they got Harry Harry Giles. And mm -hmm. Harry Giles is the one that I'm looking at, and the, and probably will be the guy that I'm I'm watching the most. Um, loads and loads of talent. Um, career derailed by injuries but they're saying if, if that knee gets right he and he can get back to close to what he was then they may have gotten a steal in the draft mm -hmm. so um so so if though like that could be part of the future in in sacramento and then you already know they got they got uh, uh buddy hilled over there so they they got some nice pieces man so um nice come up for them if if the talent works out um, I like the Mavs getting Dennis Smith at the spot that they got him in. There was a lot of high praise for him, and you know the Knicks passed on him, and uh, he kind of fell into their lap. So if he's the truth, like most are projecting him to be, then that's a good that's a good guy to get. Um, I like Monk to Charlotte. Um, you know, mm. the guy's a flat out scorer, man, uh, streaky, but I, you know, I think Charlotte. Is is in need of something like that? You know, I know. Um, gosh, the Kimball Walker tends to dominate the ball a lot, and he's used to being the scorer for that team. But it'll be it'll be nice to kind of see. Well, it'll be interesting to see how he transitions out of that, or if he can. So, um, so I like that pick there. So I think that's a good pick for them. True, indeed. What about you, FIFO? Uh, winners from the NBA draft. 
Man, first and foremost, uh, we got to go with the Lakers, man. Getting getting the right point guard for what they want to do. I, look, now, not only is LeVar putting mad pressure on all of his sons, but what Magic was saying, that's a lot of pressure. Talking about, you know, I expect to see a jersey in the rafters and all of that. Right. But I've been saying it. Lonzo Ball is the best point guard, point guard in this draft. We're not talking about averaging 20, 25 again. We're talking about point guard, making everybody around him better, making the right pass, you know, making the game easier for everybody. He's the best point guard in this draft. And I think when you look at the young talent, um, plus the trade that the Lakers made, getting rid of uh, D'Angelo Russell, bringing in uh, Brooke Lopez, when you see that you have Brandon Ingram, that he's only going to get better, he's six, 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 he's basically a, a physical mode of Kevin Durant. Then you have Julius Randle, which is not a stretch four, but a four man that can get the ball and push the rock and make plays, a playmaking four, right? You have a big man down low that can get you buckets and has three-point range. Let's not forget that Brooke Lopez has a better three-point percentage than the MVP Russell Westbrook. Don't forget that. Um, and then now we have... Uh, what's his name? Oh, man, I'll just um, – Jordan Clarkston as now they're starting to guard next to 6'6", Lonzo Ball. I think the Lakers have made the right moves. I like what they've done. Um, they're definitely a winner. Obviously, Philly, um, adding Markel Fultz, this was the process. This completes the process. You have your starting five that you drafted – plus some other guys that I still think you can move and make this team deeper. And obviously, right, man, I, hope, have... I hope, this, hope this process works. I hope it works. <laughs> hey, look, at the end of the day, the process could only get you talent. You cannot make talent um, stay healthy, right? Like those are the type of things. And that's what any basketball player, any professional athlete, you cannot guarantee or understand when something is going to happen. All you could do is pick the best players that will make a, the best collective. And so that's, far, that's, I'm, I hoping, have not I'm seen, hoping they stay hoping they stay healthy. Of course. Stay healthy. But, but when we look at the NBA over the last 10 years, name me a team that has drafted five potential all-stars or five better fit players than the five that, that, that they've drafted. You know, in terms of Joel Embiid, I told you guys years ago, Real deal, Holyfield, year one. Ben Simmons is going to be real deal, Holyfield, year one. Markel Fultz is going to be good. I'm not going to say real deal, Holyfield, but he's definitely a good player. Dario Saric, another good player. Jaleel Okafor, yeah, he gets overlooked, but he's another good player. Like, like they've drafted well. They've drafted great. So hopefully they can stay healthy. If they stay healthy, th this team is going to be out of this world in a few years. Um. Ken mentioned the Kings. The Kings did, I think, the best job out of any team. And obviously, they were the laughing stock with the DeMarcus Cousins trade at, at, at the All-Star break. But I think that they've redeemed themselves so far in the NBA draft. We have yet to see what they're going to do in NBA free agency. But in the draft, I think that they did good. They got, um, I think, the most aggressive point guard in this draft. The one guy you know ain't going to back down. The one guy that was cut from the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s cloth of basketball player. Um, and De'Arian Fox um, doesn't have a three-point shot, but obviously you can develop that over time. But he is the quickest guy in this draft with or without the ball. And he's aggressive. He's going to take it to you. He's not going to back down. I love that. Um, they get... Justin Jackson, which I think is a decent NBA player. I think when it's all said and done, I think he's going to be a rotational guy, role player, maybe a bench guy. Uh, but I think that the potential steal of the draft is Harry Jaws. Obviously, this guy has busted both ACLs and both knees. But when you look at his body, you're like, oh, my God. This guy, you could tell this is the type of guy that's going to put on 15 to 25 pounds of pure muscle when he becomes a grown man. This guy's still a baby. When he becomes a grown man, if he can stay healthy, he's going to be a beast. And when you have a point guard and a big man, you have a starting point to actually turn a franchise around. Um, so I like what the Kings did. So to me, those are the three winners. Yeah, I, I agree. You you guys stole my thunder, man. Um, Sacramento, uh, I think, did an incredible job. So you got to give 
and, and we've dumped on <laughs> Sacramento uh, plenty of times on this podcast and question whether or not Vladi Divac and uh, the owner uh, know what the hell they're doing. But I mean, like you said, picking up De'Aaron Fox at number five, uh, picking up Justin Jackson and then Frank Mason in the second round and the aforementioned uh, Harry Giles. I mean, those are four solid picks. You know, where those guys land, uh, I'm interested to see, you know, how Frank Mason the third fits in all of this. Uh, he was a guy who's the National Player of the Year. And, you know, some think that if he were just a little bit bigger, uh, he probably would have gone higher. But, you know, Frank Mason the third is, is a he's a baller, man. And he's a guy who has a lot of attitude. And I'm interested to see how that's going to be when you pair him up with De'Aaron Fox and, and what they already have there in Sacramento. Um, like Ken said, Harry Giles is the could could be the steal of the draft. Uh, he was a guy who was, you know, the consensus number one pick coming out of high school. Uh, but he's torn both of his knees up. Um, if he can stay healthy, uh, this will definitely pay off for them. Um, obviously, I think, you know, like FIFO said, the Sixers, they're winners as well because they got the point guard that they needed. Uh, they got the point guard that they wanted. As we mentioned, Minnesota Timberwolves. I think they're winners, obviously, from the draft, even though it wasn't necessarily about the draft picks. I think they come out by getting Jimmy Butler. They won in this draft as well. Um, who else, I think, was a winner? Uh, obviously, yeah, the Lakers. I agree with FIFA on that, too. Um, you know, getting um, getting ball, you know, getting Lonzo Ball, was a huge win for them. I'm not really a fan of what Magic said, you know, the kind of pressure he put on the kid, but, you know, he wants it. And he, you know, this is what it is. Um, but the, by far, the biggest winner, and let me be clear, the biggest winner of the of this particular draft, LeVar Ball. LeVar Ball is the winner because he told y'all, <laughs> he told y'all that his son was going to the Lakers. He got on national TV and said, you know, him, Jesus, and Zeus had predicted it. So, you know, <laughs> number number two goes number two to the second largest market in the United States. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, LeVar is calling it, man. So um, I, he also said that his... <laughs> His middle son isn't going to make the NBA, but you know, I mean, we'll see. But um, but yeah, man, I, Levar won, so I, I'm gonna give him his props. Uh, he ended up on WWE last night, which was a train wreck, but that's another story for another day. But yeah, another winner, Levar Ball. Now, conversely, um, B, who are some of the biggest losers of the NBA draft? Uh, the elephant in the room. My Detroit Pistons, and maybe this is just coming from just a personal, <laughs> a, a, a personal standpoint. I'm hey, pretty you sure was, people, you I'm were sure mad as hell with that. They saw that. me, they saw me going off on Twitter, man. How? But I mean, but the positive thing about it is, yes, we've been suffering at the three point shot for the past like four or five seasons. So I get it. Yes, you get a guy that's a knockdown shooter. You know, you know, a knockdown shooter and can shoot a little bit off the ball, but that's college. It's a different, it's a different animal when you're in the NBA. Can you get that shot off the off the uh, off the dribble like he did in Duke? But um, I mean, yeah, he's a tall, lanky two guard that can probably go to small forward if possible. I just, I'm just questioning his athletic ability. I don't know if he has athletic as Gordon Haywood or something Racist. like that. I would, I would probably feel a little, <laughs> a little, I would probably feel a little bit more confident if he was like somewhat athletically as gifted as Gordon Haywood with that shot. But uh, I, I, I didn't like that pick. But I thought we was gonna get um, I forgot the dude name from Louisville. I was, I, I was hoping we was gonna get him at the uh, a good athletic two guard that likes to play defense and that can shoot. Now nah, he can't shoot a three ball as well as Luke, but he can shoot. He's a, he's like one of those guys where you'd be like, oh, you can't leave him open. For a long time, because once he started knocking him down, he gonna knock him Donovan down. Donovan Mitchell. Yes, him. There it is, him. That's what it was. I was hoping we got him, but or a dude from Kentucky. But then I think the team that picked right before us picked him up. Uh, Mook Monk. Monk. Yeah. Yeah. I was hoping we was gonna get him, but you know that that's my losers. <laughs> that's, well, that's my loser. True indeed, true indeed. FIFO, what about you, man? Who are some of the losers in this year's NBA draft? Um, man, that's, you know, honestly, that, that's kind of tough for me because I think everybody drafted who they needed to draft. Um, I, you know, I, in all honesty, if I, if I have to, if I have to pick just one loser, 
And it's not because of who they picked, but because of the composition of that roster. It, it just didn't make sense to me was Orlando with Jonathan Isaac. Okay. Because you have a lot of big men already there. You have a lot of guys, six, eight to six, 10, you know, seven feet type of guys. And I think passing up Dennis Smith, it was the wrong move because as much as I like, uh, who, who's the crazy hair point guard they got? Payton. Uh, Alfred Payton. Alfred Payton. You, yeah. And, and, I, and, and I remember years ago when he got drafted, I said, I liked him, but I think he's the one guy that's holding that team back. Because you can play off of him. He's not a scoring threat. Yes, he can defend his position. Yes, he's a playmaker. But he can't make free throws. He can't make a mid-range shot. You don't necessarily have to have a three-point shot. But you have to keep the defense honest. And offensively, he holds that team back. So I think they were in prime position to get you a point guard of the future. Because that's the most competitive position in the nba right now and if you get a guy that is an athletic freak like dennis smith you get a a grinder type of coach like frank vogel that i think that can extract the most out of the dennis smith i i just think orlando missed the target there but again it's not because of jonathan isaac because i like him as a player i think he'll be nice but i think just for the fit of that roster dennis smith uh would have would have been a better fit what about you, Ken? Uh, losers in the draft. Um, I have two. So the first one uh, that comes to mind is I- Ivan Robb. Because okay, he, okay. <laughs> he went back a year, um, mm-hmm. which is cool. But if he would have came out last year, they say he, more than likely he would have been a lottery pick. Um, and, and, of course, we all saw he went in the second round. I'm glad he got drafted. Um, maybe it will um, motivate him. To, uh, to to get better and, and show everybody that they made a mistake, and he can you know parlay that into a uh, into a payday. But man, like there's a lesson to be learned there. But you know, but anyway, um, and the and the second loser I have is Levar Ball. Uh, <laughs> LeVar How's Levar Ball, loser, man? Levar Ball, man, he he's the loser, man. You you get up there talking about the Lakers are gonna go to the playoffs. In oh, the yeah. first year with, 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 with Lonzo, I heard everything you said, Kyle. I don't disagree with it. And that's why I'm not saying any of that is the reason why he's the loser. <laughs> but then you turn around. I forgot about that. Out of everything that you have did, everything that you said have, have, have gotten right, you've been quiet <laughs> up until the draft. And you just couldn't help yourself, LeVar. <laughs> you just couldn't help yourself. <laughs> Let Lonzo have his moment. And you just had to steal the shine. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, losers, man. I obviously, again, it didn't have anything to do with the draft per se, but Chicago loses big time for me uh, in losing Jimmy Butler. Um, I think the Celtics lost some, man. Um, I think if Markel Fultz turns out to be the player that people are predicting that he will be, then I think. Down the line, you know, Danny Ainge is going to be looking real crazy because he passed on, you know, drafting him first. And I know, of course, you know, they're going to have to make a decision down the road whether or not you're going to max out a guy like Isaiah Thomas, who's, you know, 28, 29, 30 point score per game. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is that could this kid really be the real deal and be the future? Uh, and there's no knock on Jason Tatum. I think, you know, Jackson, Josh Jackson might have been a better fit um, for that Celtics team. But Jason Tatum's game is is right there, and I think he's going to, you know, do well in Boston. But my loser in this is in saying the Celtics, I think they could have come away with so much more. And we talked and talked and talked at nauseam about these, you know, these assets. At some point, you got to cash in, man. What what good is it holding on to the chips? And I, I understand that at some point that they will but when does that point come could it it could and, and we could be premature for all we know by this time next week there could be a huge blockbuster trade to go down i'm not sure there's been rumors about you know them making a run at paul george as well as uh uh what's the kid from utah um man, his name just slipped me gordon hayward um so yeah but right now i, I think the celtics i i would give them an l for right now so we'll see. 
at the time of this recording, last night, the NBA held its inaugural uh, NBA awards show. Uh, this was the award show that, you know, where you got named the coach of the year, defensive player of the year, executive of the year, MVP, uh, so forth and so on. Um, it was aired live on TNT. The TNT crew was there, uh, hosted by Aubrey, um, you know, who I guess did a good job. I, guess, I, I, don't, I really wasn't impressed with what he did, but that's another story for another day. Nonetheless, man, let's talk about some of these winners, man. Mike D'Antoni wins coach of the year. B, are you okay with that? Yeah, I think when we was discussing, like, you know, potential candidates and stuff, like, you know, MVP candidates, coach of the year candidates, defensive player, I remember I remember mentioning him as, you know, coach of the year, just the way how he transformed James Harden. Like, mm-hmm. he made me like James Harden. <laughs> like, I was like, man, I actually like James Harden playing a point, the way the offense was, was, was just running, man, how they was killing it. You know, we we didn't we didn't think that they were going to be a three C in the West. You know, pi- almost fighting for a two C at one point with San Antonio. So, um, you know, win as many games as they won, especially after Dwight Howard going. You like, okay, lose a, a, a good big guy like him, but Dan Tony just refueled that offense and had them boys playing lights out. So, you know, unfortunately, of course, Dan Tony style, but we're not including the playoffs. But Dan Tony style, they always. Always fall short in the playoffs when they count the most. But regular season wise, oh yeah, I, I definitely had no issues with Dan Tony winning Coach of the Year. I was I was cool with that. I was definitely cool with that. What about you, FIFO? Your thoughts on Dan Tony winning Coach of the Year? Yeah, I think I think when you look at the uh, the NBA and which teams had the biggest jump, uh, it has to be Houston. You know what 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 Dan Tony was able to do with his system. Um, to go to a team that had his style players. And remember, when, when, when D'Antoni went to the Lakers, I was on record saying, trade for Josh Smith, give D'Antoni the type of personnel he needs to be great. But no, they wanted to stick with Paul Gasol and Dwight Howard. And then when we saw it, it with that personnel, we're like, well, why is Paul Gasol shooting threes in the corner? Right? But it's a big difference when it's Ryan Anderson. Right. So so at the end of the day, it's not that that D'Antoni did anything spectacular or completely turned around something. He was just the right man for the job. And what he did, like like B said, because I, I, I was over James Harden. He made me like James Harden as well this season. I liked him as a point guard. I liked the strides that James Harden took as a player. Obviously, he still needs to grow as a leader. I don't think he'll ever be that. That's just me personally. But at the end of the day, he did have a profound impact on James Harden and made him an even better player and made that overall team perform at a higher level. So I definitely give him props for that. But I think that somebody, my dark horse winner for me was Eric Spolstra. Who okay. the hell thought that the Miami Heat was going to be a viable team? Right, And the right. type of uh, uh, <clears throat> streak that they were able to catch on? Oh, my God. It, it, uh, come on, man. Who, who who saw that? And I've been saying, Spolster was a hell of a coach, even when he had the big three with LeBron, D. Wade, and Bosh. Because everybody always wanted to question Spolster. Spolster has a system. Spolster is very underrated in this league. And... and let this guy get some talent again. I guarantee you he'll be up for coach of the year again. True indeed. True indeed. What about you, Ken? Uh, your thoughts on Dan Tony bringing home the trophy for coach of the year. I was okay with it when, when I saw it, man. I, I mean, it, it makes sense um, that he, he did, you know, that he would win coach of the year. And I really don't have much more to add than what Ralph or B said. So, yeah, I, I was cool with it. Yeah, same here. I was cool with it. I, I would have, um, if Spo had won, I would have been cool with that as well. I think, like FIFO said, I think if you look at what the Miami Heat did, particularly the last, the back half of the the season, you know, they were one of the they were one of the teams that played the best. You know, including Cleveland and Golden State down the stretch. Um, they just you know didn't have enough to get in as far as get into the playoffs, but. Man, that and that's coaching. And I know, you know, a lot of people were down on Spo when, you know, when he had the big three there, LeBron James, uh, Chris Bosch, and D. Wade. But um Eric Spolstra can coach. I mean, make no mistake about it. And, you know, although he did not win this award, I'm pretty sure there's gonna be one in his future. You can bet on that. 
Um, what about Draymond Green winning the Defensive Player of the Year award? Ken, your thoughts on Draymond bringing home another trophy? I'm happy for the brother, man. He he said it was a goal of his. He set out to accomplish it, and and he did. And in watching some of the games this year, and seeing like some of the things that he did on the court defensively, man, like it. It's amazing sometimes, man, to see a guy impact a game in that way. And um, and I think it was at that point, and I can't remember what game it was, but I think it was at that point I was like, yeah, I, I think he he deserves to win it, uh, defensive uh, player of the year. And I would have been shocked if he, if he didn't win it. Um, so much like Russell Wilson being talked up for MVP, um, a lot of people talked of Draymond Green for Defensive Player of the Year, and I think it was much deserved. So uh, I'm not going to hate on the brother this show. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to let him live. Uh, Y'all notice he said on this show. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That'll speak for the next show. But, yeah, on this show, he not going to hate on him. Um, FIFA, what about you, man? Your thoughts on Draymond uh, winning Defensive Player of the Year? Uh, one of the best uh, defenders in the NBA, man. Man could literally guard all five positions. So I, I, I don't have anything negative to say. Um, you know, I, I definitely think there was other guys that uh, were worthy of the award. But when you look at the impact that Draymond has defense, just just, just look at the uh, – who, 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 what, what team was that against? Was that against Utah when he had the double block? Yeah. How how, how many guys in the league can make that play, especially at his size? So, no, man, I I, I have zero issues with Draymond Green winning the defensive player of the year. What about you, B? Uh, no, I mean, you, you can always make that argument of Kawhi Leonard because, but we, you know, we all know how great of a defender Kawhi Leonard is. It's kind of like the same thing with, to me, Kawhi Leonard defensively is like LeBron James of defense. It's like, you can always throw LeBron James in for MVP or have an argument for him being MVP. The same case you can make for Kawhi Leonard being defensive player of the year damn near like every year. Um, but, yeah, I have no issue with Ben Green, um, you know, being winning the award. I mean, I have, you know, there's only guys I like like defensively, like Patrick Beverly. He just, he's so, he's so gutter, man. I, I love how Patrick Beverly just. He's just annoying. Happy. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's 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 a good defender, man. When when they annoying as hell, man. I, I, and I love that. Just me playing. You know, I used to be kind of like that annoying type of guard that just be getting under people's skin or whatever. But I, I love that type of play. So yeah, Patrick Beverly, Kawhi Leonard, Draymond Green. Like I have no issue with Draymond Green one year. Just like Ken and Ralph. It's like hey, ain't nothing else to say. This dude can literally guard all five positions. Just like a la Dennis Rodman. And guard all five positions with, with ease and not have an issue and still and still make those hustle plays. So, yeah, Draymond Green, hey, give my vote. Represent Michigan State uh, Spartans. I thought Kawhi would win. Uh, if I had a vote, I would have given it to Kawhi. Um, I would have given it to Kawhi just on the strength of I think we need to at least hear Kawhi Leonard talk, even though because most of us don't know what he sounds like. Um, but yeah, but I, I don't have a problem with Draymond winning. I do have a problem with that get up he had on at the awards. Um, I thought that there was a dress code in effect. That man showed up in, it looked like he had on the same suit that Gucci Mane had on at the BT awards. And then he had on like some shorts and some loafers with no socks. I mean, he just looked a hot mess. But other than that, yeah, you know, I, I Dre, you, you can make a strong case for Draymond. I had no beef with Draymond winning. Um, and subsequently, well, actually, the other awards that were given out, uh, just let me just run these down real quick. Uh, Eric Gordon from the Houston Rockets won six man of the year uh, to some to the surprise of some. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon from the Milwaukee Bucks won the uh, rookie of the year over Joel Embiid and Darko Saric. Um and uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Antetokounmpo. <laughs> Antetokounmpo. There it is. I got it. <laughs> Won the uh, most improved player of the year. And I think it goes without saying, I think that guy is going to definitely be in the discussion for some future MVP uh, consideration in the years to come. Um, but yeah, but the main event, uh, the, the award that we kind of waited around for until the end of the night, uh, yeah. Russell Westbrook beats out James Harden um, 
to win the MVP after his historic season where he averaged a triple-double for the first time in 55 years uh, that we'd ever seen that happen in the NBA, beating out James Harden. I think uh, Russell Westbrook got most of the votes. I want to say James Harden got like 29 votes. I think Russell Westbrook got uh, 66 votes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Kawhi finished third, and LeBron got one first-place vote, uh, finishing fourth. Uh, B, your thoughts, man. Triple double. We hadn't seen it in, in, in 55 years of the game. Uh, but Russell Westbrook is your MVP. Your thoughts on it, man. It's, it's so funny. Every time I had this conversation with my dad, cause, like every time we used to talk about like, you know, someone doing matching Oscar Robinson, my dad was one of those guys. I was like, man, I never think that would happen. I don't think no one ever averaged triple double again. Just like no one ever averaged 50 and 24 rebounds in a season again. So, um, yeah, but when Russell Westbrook averaged this triple-double, in my opinion, I was like, wow, this is no way this dude don't win MVP. But granted, when Oscar Robinson did it, he didn't win MVP. He lost to a Bill Russell. Um, so, I, you know, I was I was kind of like thinking like, man, they might just end up giving to uh, James Harden because, you know, his team won more games and they were like in the, the top team in the Western Conference with a third-best record in the league. So, but, yeah, I think it's great, man. I think it's well-deserved. I think Russell Westbrook played on 100,000 every game, did not let up, played pretty much every game except for one. I think he shut out one game, I believe. So he played 81 games. For him to have a triple – and he broke the record for most triple-doubles in the season. So, I mean, come on, man. Like, anyone – if you if you don't play ball, you have no idea how hard that is at that level of basketball to do that on a consistent basis, man. That's unheard of. I don't care what you say. People talk talk down on it and be like, oh, well, he the, he the man on his team, of course. Whatever. You be the man on your team and you try to average triple-double. As a matter of fact, try to average a double-double every every for most of the season. <laughs> and, and see how they – people laugh. Right. You know, man, yeah. Know, Especially at point guard. A, a, especially yeah. being a little guy on the court, bro. No, that it's it's extremely hard. It's right. extremely hard. No I'm doubt. Done. No I'm doubt. What, what about you, FIFA? Your thoughts on it? You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm, I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. I'm, I'm saying like, are there other guys more deserving of the MVP that had a better season in terms of impact on their squad? I would say yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you beat a record like that, and you do it in in the way that Russell Westbrook plays the game, because. We've seen other guys have a lot of triple doubles, obviously not as many and not to average one, but like the Jason kids and stuff like that. You know, I like to say he had skinny triple doubles, 12 points, you know, 11 Mm -hmm. rebounds, 13 assists. Nah, this dude Westbrook is getting 40 points, 15 rebounds, 13, uh, 15 rebounds, 13 assists, 14 assists. Like, bro, like, like, what the heck? Like you're, you're accounting for like 80% of the offense. You know what I'm saying? So, so, I don't have no problems with him getting that, t- that getting the MVP because he he earned it. Again, you know, did he fall short in the playoffs? Yes. Again, is he the most efficient player? No, he's not. But at the end of the day, to to average a triple double in this at the NBA level, to do it in the fashion that he did. Mm-hmm. I'm saying, and even if you take Russell Westbrook off of that squad, right? Like he doesn't necessarily make players better, but if you take him off of that squad, that squad's a lottery team, right? So for him to get him to the playoffs in the West, even though he didn't win 50 games, it is what it is, man. I think this year he definitely earned it. True, indeed, true, indeed. What about you, Ken? Your thoughts on the new MVP, Mr. Russell Westbrook? Um, well deserved, well earned. Um, He has a LeBron James type impact on that team. And what I mean by that is that we saw in the playoffs when LeBron sat down, what happened? Go to State going to 12, 12 point run, 12 0 run. Uh, Team falls apart. Can't get anything done offensively. That's what happens when Russell Westbrook sits down for OKC. They just fall apart. We saw it in the playoffs too. That's what he did this year. Like Rap said, without him, they're they're a lottery team. They're a lottery team. They don't make the playoffs. They, he needed to average a triple double in order for them to not only win games but make the playoffs. You know when when it first broke, and I was hoping 
that he won this year because I know James Harden had one hell of a season. Mm-hmm. And I, I know he's disappointed. I know he's upset. That and, he hey, he, yeah. And then Ken, not, not to cut you off right quick, but and I, I do I do feel a little bad for James Harden because you know this thing. Last year he was one of the top uh, candidates for MVP, and Steph Curry had a, a freaking record set. <laughs> lost yep. that, and now he had another. He had a, he had even a better season this year and lost to a triple double Russell Westbrook. So I, I feel a little bad for Harden. But go ahead. Yeah, no, nah, I, I, you're right. And, you know, when, when the news broke, the first thing that came came to my mind is that Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant both won this year, mm-hmm. just in different waves. You know, Russell Westbrook is not an MVP of the league if Kevin Durant is still on that team. Kevin Durant is not a champion if he didn't leave to go play with Golden State Warriors. He, good point, I mean, good point. So... Even though KD has the championship, it's not like Russell didn't get anything. It, it, you know, and it's it's almost like it's a participation trophy a little bit, I guess. <laughs> but, but you know, I I, I I don't know, man. It's just a weird way I, I kind of looked at it. Like, man, you, you lost your boy. He went on. He's wearing cupcake hats. Cut that out, <laughs> KD. Um, Ain't nothing wrong with that. Russ started it. Russ started it. Uh, okay, we for those of you listening, Kevin Kevin Durant showed up somewhere in public. This, you know, and and people had criticized him, calling him a cupcake in o- Oklahoma City, particularly the fans of Oklahoma City. So he showed up somewhere in public uh, with a hat on, and and in the hat it had a, a picture of a cupcake, and there was a small golden ring on top of the cup, top of the uh, cupcake. So, uh, you know, Kevin Durant's having his last lap. Go ahead, go ahead, FIFO. Ken, how you coming at KD for winning the ring? Y'all called me soft. Y'all called me a cupcake, and I showed out in these finals. It's not like I rode the coattails of anybody on this Warrior squad. This facts. Honestly, yes, they won because of me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yes, hey, 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 cut yes, Ken's line did. off. Cut he, Ken's he, line he off. He rolled their coattails all the way to the finals. Come on, I kid. Give you Come on, that. kid. I give you that. He he rode their coattails to the finals. But once they got I wouldn't even go that far. I think um you know what? Let's not do Russell Westbrook like this. Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's let's talk about so my my take on Russell Russell. Westbrook. Yeah, exactly. Congratulations, man. I think uh and for those of you listening, hopefully you got a chance. If you did not get a chance when you finished listening to this podcast, uh, check out his uh, acceptance speech. I thought it was very, very powerful. Uh, he got emotional. Brought it, first and foremost, he brought his teammates up there, which I thought was classy because, you know, he understands that, no, you don't – and like and B made a great point. People don't have an idea of how hard it is to get one triple-double. I mean, it's hard as hell getting a double-double, let alone a triple-double, particularly – and people made a great point. Of someone who's small. Keep in mind, Russell Westbrook is only 6'2", 6'3". So it's not like he's 6'9", like Magic was, or anything like that. Or 6'6", like Jordan, where you can go in in there with the trees and get those rebounds. Um, you know, to, So to do what he did was it was phenomenal. Um, yeah, man, his, his speech was incredible, man. He, he brought his teammates up there. He thanked his parents. He got emotional. Thanked his wife and newborn son. Um, did not thank Kevin Durant. I was waiting on that. Uh, <laughs> Why would he? I I I I knew it wasn't coming, people. I was just like sitting on edge, like I wonder if he's gonna say something to KD. But it it, it was perfect, man. It, it was a great speech, and um, he deserved it. And, and you know, shout out to Harden, man. Harden had an incredible year, uh, and like B said, it, it's nothing to sneeze at with the numbers that he put up, particularly when you look at you know what Houston was. Um, and then, you know, Kawhi had a great year, too, as well. And Ka- Kawhi played really well down the stretch. Uh, he even cut his braids off. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> he looks like a new dude. Uh, and then, you know, of course, fourth but not last is LeBron. Um, what can I say? He's He may have finished fourth, but I think I'm not alone in saying that LeBron James is still the best player in the NBA right now. Um, and there's no shame in finishing fourth. Uh, you know, these guys just had phenomenal years. The thing is, LeBron, what LeBron does is what he does on a night-to-night basis. I think people are kind of desensitized to it. So it he makes it look so easy. 
you know, the man averaged a triple double for the finals. Um, but nonetheless, man, shout out to Russell Westbrook uh, for winning. Like I said, it, his, his acceptance speech was incredible. Um, and, you know, for those who think that Russell Westbrook should not have won it, all I say is go back to last summer. Last summer when we got the word that Kevin Durant was leaving, nobody thought this would be a playoff team. Nobody could have foreseen this. We all thought that there would be a lottery team and that Russell Westbrook was going to have to put up a lot of shots and they weren't going to be able to get it done. And they make the playoffs. He averages a triple-double. You know, hopefully they can get him some help so he doesn't have to do this next year. But incredible year. Salute to Russell Westbrook. Um, also, before we move on, uh, they also recognize the – executive of the year uh that was the warriors gm bob myers he was named executive of the year uh i i commented on twitter i said i thought he should share that award with draymond green since draymond green recruited kevin durant (laughs) Um, (laughs) and they also did a special tribute uh giving away the first recipient of the inaugural sega strong award to uh warriors excuse me um san antonio spurs uh I think he's front office guy now, Monty Williams, who tragically lost his wife uh, in a car accident when he was an assistant for the Oklahoma City Thunder a little more than a year ago. Um, and this is the award that was named in the in honor of the great K- Craig Sager, who passed away uh, this past December. Moving on to baseball. Uh, and, and before we get into this baseball topic, shout out to the asshole who commented on our YouTube channel and said, you guys should take base, the baseball out of your logo because you never talk baseball. Listen, asshole, we're talking baseball now. Um, and whoever said that, I'm not even going to give you a name, but you know who the, you are, you asshole. Um, nonetheless, this past week, man, I uh, had a couple of things happen. Man, We saw uh, Jared Dyson break up uh, Justin Verlander's uh, perfect game by bunting to get on base. There's an unwritten rule that you don't bunt to break up a no-hitter or a perfect game. Um, we also saw Yasiel Puig uh, stand at the plate after he hit home run, and he watched that thing fly, and he stood there and stood there and pulled, <laughs> took a couple of shots. And then it, I think they said it took him 39 seconds to get around the bases. So his home run trot was extremely slow. Uh, he did that against the Mets, and as he was rounding first base, um, Mets infielder Wilma Flores uh, said something to him, and uh, Puig hit him with an F you on, <laughs> on his way to home plate. Uh, so we've talked about it before, man, but baseball has a lot of unwritten rules. Um, B, I'll start first with you, man. What do you think about these unwritten rules, man? Uh, I think it's good because it spikes up baseball. It got us talking about baseball. Um, cause we always said like every, every time we talking about any other sport in the U S except for baseball. So mm-hmm. I like when they have these unwritten rules cause it kind of, it keeps the game spiced up. It keeps us talking about it. <laughs> Whenever some drama happens, because that's unfortunately we need some drama to happen for us to talk about baseball because they don't promote their stars enough. So, right. Yeah. I'm I'm cool with the unwritten rules and, and and all the mozzi and stuff going on with these players, man. We need we need we need to spice up this game of baseball, man. It's too they're keeping that old tradition for too much, and it's not it's not evolving like all the rest of the sports have. No doubt, no doubt. What about you, FIFO, man? Your man Puig. He stood there and stood there and just chilled and watched that home run go over, man. And and it, it rubbed him the wrong way, man. Like I said, it, he took his own sweet time about coming around the bases. That's just one of the unwritten rules in baseball, man. How, how What do you think about unwritten rules in baseball? Man, forget all the damn unwritten rules in baseball. That's why the hell <laughs> That's why the hell they, 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 they are where they are in terms of the major leagues, man. Look, the p- people want controversy people want talking points people want the long ball people want the antics why all these old ass antiquated 1900s mm-hmm. baseball unwritten rules let these guys be the 2017 version of a professional athlete if that's what they want to do stare it down don't throw me a pitch i can hit out the park then that I, I that that's just how I feel, and that's primarily the reason why I don't like watching baseball. It's not that exciting, and then the guys that are exciting, they 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 don't have the antics. You know, what I'm saying like like that's that's the major thing with football, and I'm glad that football has lifted some of this some of these bands on celebrations and things of that nature because that's what the people pay to see. Those mm-hmm. are the talking points. That's what makes your sport relevant. Who who who's this guy? Um, the other guy with with, with the Dodgers that's hitting. 
all these damn home runs as a rookie. He done hit like Cody, 24. Cody Bellinger. Cody, Cody Bellinger. Bellinger. Like, how do I know about him, but I don't even know his name? I should know this man's name. The only reason why I know Yasiel Puig is because he's from Cuba, and I support all of my Cubans out here doing some things. But I, we should know Cody Bellinger's – we should be nonstop talking about this guy. This guy shouldn't be abiding by the unwritten rules. He should be watching all of these home runs all out the park. That Like, that's what baseball needs, and they don't promote that. They should promote that. That's a major, major – issue for for baseball man and, and uh it's just frustrating it's it's extremely frustrating no doubt no doubt what about you ken your your thoughts on the unwritten rules in baseball well i, I think what what we learned is this is why they don't want black folks playing in back baseball <laughs> <laughs> you're right you know, though you're right man you, man you know how we are man like like dog like we got we got swag, man. Cause I can imagine, like, cause I would do the same thing. Boy, if 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 I connected on one and sent sent it out the park, oh, I'm showing out. Oh, I'm showing <laughs> out. I am taking my time getting across the bases. That's my time, and I'm gonna rub it in all the way, the whole game. And you know what? Fits your pictures. You don't want me <laughs> trotting around. Then, like Ralph said, don't throw me something I can hit out. And it, and it's that simple. And the same thing with uh, Jared Dyson breaking up that perfect game. Hey man, right? Hey, you're not about to get a perfect game on me. So I'm gonna <laughs> do what I can to make sure that that don't happen. Not on my watch. Exactly. So if I gotta hit a bunt to break that up, then so be it. Now I'll let that other team that want to play by these unwritten rules have a perfect game thrown on them. But when the game is over and that that final line is gonna read one hit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're right, Ken. Cause, cause what's what's the objective in baseball? To get on base, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it doesn't matter how you get. When I saw that man and I saw the people getting upset, I'm like, yo, Dyson had to get on base the best way that he could. And we've all seen Justin Verlander throw the ball. I mean, Justin Verlander is one of the best pitchers, not only in the game, but one of the best pitchers of his generation. I mean, that's safe to say. And you got to get on. And he figured, okay, well, hell. First baseman's playing back off. I could probably get this down before Ver- Verlander's not going to be expecting it. So I could probably get it past him, drop it in there, and I, I could get the first base and I'm on. And that's all that you want. You could kind of tell Verlander was pissed. He, he kind of downplayed it after the game, but I got no problem with that, man. Um, You know, what Puig did, I find it interesting that, you know, a lot of times uh, baseball, quote unquote, purists be on this, you know, make baseball great again tip. You know, not, not kill all that. You know, my thing is, and now this was one of the few times where you had a Latin player do something and another Latin player criticize him for it. I don't think, you know, I mean, and Flores, I I kind of understand where he was coming from to some degree, but the Mets suck. So, you know, I mean, what do you expect? If you don't want Puig to hit a home run against you, you know, don't give up home run balls. It's the same thing, you know, like guys would get upset about dudes dancing in the end zone in football. If you don't want to see me dancing in the end zone, you know, keep me out of the end zone. You know, so I don't I'm not a fan of these unwritten rules because there's so many unwritten rules in baseball and baseball needs some spice. It needs some flavor. Um, you know, it's not and that's not to say that it is not watchable. I think fans, you can bring in casual fans. But when you got when you have guys like Bryce Harper and you know Mike Trout, and when those guys can walk down the street, and nobody knows who they are, or what they look like. You know that means you're not promoting your stars. And we've talked about this before, and it's just not. Baseball really doesn't cook up and get heated until after the All Star break. And you know sometimes with some baseball teams, it's more or less about the team and not necessarily not necessarily the player. So I'm I'm all for players showing emotion, you know, flipping bats or doing whatever, having bring a little swag to the game. But these unwritten rules got to go, man, because, you know, if the Mets were really about that life, then Puig would have got plunked the next time that he came up to bat. They didn't hit him, you know, but, you know, they know Puig don't play anyway. So, you know, it would have been a fight, you know, anyway. So it didn't it doesn't I mean, they would they would have jumped on him like the Migos about to jump on Joe Budden. So <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> 
Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening to another edition of the Dead End Sports Podcast. It is time that we put a bow on this week's show. Uh, time for our final thoughts. First up, my man, Beezy. Beezy, BZ, what you got for your final thought? Damn you, Detroit Pistons. Damn you, Detroit Pistons. I am, been a, I am a lifelong Pistons fan, and they really ticked me off in this draft. The only thing I can say is I hope that this guy proves me wrong and he shuts me up and I'm looking stupid by the time we in January, February in the season. So other than that, damn you Detroit Pistons, I'm pissed. No doubt, no doubt. Next up, my man FIFO. FIFO, what's your final thought? Summer League, where you at, where you at, where you at. I need you. I need to see all these young cats. This was a deep draft. I'm really interested to see who's ready to compete at this NBA level. Um, I think that Lonzo or the Lakers uh, uh, summer league games, they're all going to be sold out. It is definitely going to be box office. True indeed. True indeed. What about you, Ken? I love petty. I like being petty. Um, But damn, KD, man. Man, <laughs> stop with stop with the pettiness, dog. Like, you know, like I I really got words for KD, but I understand that this is his moment. This is what he won uh, the title for to to get some get backs and to be the king of petty. So I'm gonna let him off this time. Um, but if you're still doing this by the time we come back, <laughs> John McEnroe. Stop hating. Mm. Stop hating. Um, let Serena, Serena uh, be great. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it's okay. Right. Like, it's why okay, bring man. that up? Why yeah. bring that up? Like, she's not even a man. Like, why right. bring that up? Because he know that she would probably beat him. So, he's a little insecure. But oh, 700, dog? 700? <laughs> Not like top one hundred, right? Not 700. fifty. This dude said seven hundred male tennis players will be bet are will be better than Serena Williams if she played. Man. Look, I'm gonna just stop hating. That's all I gotta say. Just stop hating, because right now I, I, that could be something else. But I ain't gonna say what it could be. So I'm gonna just say stop hating. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, my final thought, man, the big three has tipped off. Uh, I am a fan of basketball, and if you're a fan of basketball, you definitely want to check out the big three. If you're asking what is the big three as the league, you know, created and cultivated by uh, Ice Cube, uh, where's three on three? Um, They tipped off this past weekend, uh, you know, in front of record crowds, you know, some of the older uh, elder statesmen of, you know, the NBA are now in the big three guys that we used to watch uh, five, maybe 10 years ago, uh, you know, playing in the NBA, playing in three on three. Uh, you know, some of the games got off to a little rock, rocky start. Some of the rules are different from regular basketball, but it's three on three. I love it. I think it, you want to see a guy like Allen Iverson. You want to see a guy like Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. You see these guys go out there and play because, at the, you know, these guys can, you know, say, okay, well, hey, I'm not going to go that hard. I'm not going to do this, not going to do that. At the end of the day, at the core of who these men are, they're basketball players. And once they step on the court and there's a crowd around the court, they're going to be ready to ball. So anytime you get a chance to check out the big three, make sure to check it out. It's going to be must-see TV for the summer. And another way that the NBA is trying to make sure that they are in the news cycle even as the season has ended. And so far, it's off to a great start. So I can't wait to see even more. That's going to do it for us. Thanks again for checking out another edition of the Dead End Sports Podcast. Uh, Once again, for FIFO, for BZ, for my man Kent, I am your host, 12 Kyle. Thank you for checking out Dead in Sports. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace. 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 Kafifi. Who? Kafifi.